Just have to make sure not to shout too loud and make it feedback. Yes, I've done that before. It wasn't funny. Um, anyway, this talk is called Distributed Demon Discovery. Uh, so, uh, I want to kind of point out this is uh, for one. As a rare occasion, um, rather than talking about the stuff that I've spent my weekends writing, um, I'm actually getting to talk about something that I spent my weekdays writing. Um, so, um, I, I, am, I, am here, I am here talking on behalf of the Shadowcat team as well as myself, um, because my, my tendency to say well volunteered and get other people to do most of the work does extend to my working time as well. Um, but I'm, this talk is also on behalf of Social Flow, uh, who were kind enough to not only sponsor the development of the code that I'm going to be talking about, um, but also have uh, let me actually use some live data collected from their production systems um, in order to give you a demonstration later. It's not quite a live demo because conference wireless, um, but I've asked Sync down all of the stuff that I need. So hopefully, you'd, hopefully I'm actually going to get to show you some code running um, later on in the talk. Um, and I also want to, want to actually make a point of saying thank you to Phalon who's one of the Shadowcat team who actually wrote most of the code that I'm going to be telling you about. Um, but, you know, he, 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 he takes a lot more enjoyment out of programming than out of standing up in front of a bunch of people talking rubbish. So, uh, you know, I get to be volunteered for that part. Uh, <laughs> every time I give a talk for the second time, I say something to the talk, click and go, oh yeah, I actually had a slide that said that as well, but I've already said it now. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so distributed demon discovery. Uh, what? Okay, uh, try and explain what, what the sort of situation here is. Um, the problem is um, a problem that I think many of you will have run into on occasion. Uh, you, you have this situation where, you know, your infrastructure is not as automated as you like. Obviously, you, you want to have sort of um, serious control of what's running on your machines. You want to know where everything is. But, you know, uh, you, this is something I run into all the time because um, a fair percentage of Shadowcat's customers are startups. And the, the worst thing here is they, they, they always get embarrassed. When, when we first take on a... Because, you know, we're... We're called in to provide basically heavy CPAN hacking and sort of um, effectively commercial support for the CPAN stack. And they all go, oh, but our, our, co our code is terrible. It, it's awful. You're, you're, you're going to hate this. You're going to shout at us. I'm thinking, well, well no. No, because the re you know, th this, this code, okay, you might hate how some of it looks, but it's doing something useful enough to be making enough money that you could convince your management to hire us to help make it better. It, it can't be that bad. I mean, it can be that ugly, but, you know, uh, <laughs> your customers don't care if the code is ugly. Your customers care if the service works. If the service works, no matter how much the code is annoying you, you've done something right. Uh, you know, it, it's very much a question of the thing to always remember. And so, something I think all of us sometimes forget in the quest to have the most beautiful, elegant, wonderful code possible is that unless it ships and does something a customer cares about, it's worthless no matter how pretty it is. Um, I mean, you know, if, if I wanted to work on, um, on, on beautiful ideas that mean absolutely nothing to other people, I, I could have stuck on my original career path and gone into pure mathematics research. Um, I, I switched over to programming because I really quite enjoy the idea that, okay, I mean, in my case, I'm usually writing libraries, so it's, I write code that helps somebody else write code that helps somebody else write code that does something for a normal human being. But <coughs> the part where at some point it actually helps somebody do something they care about is really the point. Um, so, insufficiently automated infrastructure is always fun. Because you, you, you get into the situation of, okay, I want to automate. I want to automate deployment. I want to automate patching. But I don't know what's there yet. So, you know, the, the, the first step is to try and figure out what's actually going on on these machines. Because, you know, people have set them up. They've been humming along happily for a year or so.
but you're not, you've not got documentation on what's on that server because you set it up quickly to get the product launched, to get the customers happy, to get the money, in, and then you had to go and do something else. So um, figuring out the big picture of what's running where um, has to be the first step to being able to figure out what, what's going to give you the most value to automate. So, okay, um, the usual approach to that is, you know, you log into the machine, you look around the machine, you write up what's running on the machine, and eventually, eventually, you, you try and get a complete set of documentation about what's running there. And that's great, but it's a process. Um, and, you know, the, the entire reason we're interested in automation here is that we are all human and we all screw up. Whereas a sufficiently well-tested piece of code will do the right, will do the same thing every single time. Uh, so, using a manual solution to a problem of we're doing too many things manually struck me as this is really not the right answer. Uh, I mean, that approach just makes no sense. Um, so, okay, well, what else do we do? Well, you write code to go and find the information for us. Obviously, that, that's going to be a better approach. Uh, okay, but how do we get the code onto the machines? Well, you know, you, you use an automated deployment system. Uh, but the whole point of this is we don't have that yet. So uh, you, you, you've got, you know, chicken and egg problem. Can't get there from here. Uh, so you, you think, okay, well, uh, how else can I, can I make this happen? Easy. Object remote. Because object remote, I connect to another host, uh, or, and I ask for um, an instance of a class, and it sends the class over the wire for me. So I, I have an ops machine. I install all of the things I need onto the ops machine, and then object remote lets me pretend that all of those modules are already installed on all of the servers that I'm going to be talking to. So, okay, that's that problem solved. Um, I'm not going to need to install anything on there. All I need to rely on is there being a copy of Perl on the far end. And given this is a Shadowcat customer, I can reasonably assume they're going to have Perl on their servers, right? Um, and I'm not actually giving that lightning talk this conference. I thought I'd deleted that slide. Apparently, I deleted the other slide that didn't make sense and forgot this one because I'm an idiot. Um, thereby very well demonstrating why we don't want to do this stuff manually. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so we, we can get code running on the far end. Um, you, you then run into, right, fine, great. Uh, what do we do with the output? So, you know, my, my first thought is going to be, let, let's put it in a database. We've got a dozen Postgres instances already doing various jobs, that's fine. Um, but, okay, I love Postgres, but... A lot of the point of this is it's kind of, the, the, the purpose of this code is to grope about in the dark and find stuff out. So I'm, I'm going to be changing things all of the time. Uh, so I don't really know what the schema is in advance. I want to be able to write a new probe that goes and figures something out and just have the data there. So uh, a, a, a traditional RDBMS is not the immediately good option. So, okay, at this point, somebody is going to mention MongoDB. and then I'm going to hit them with this. <laughs> Serious. Oh. Uh, my, my opinion of MongoDB fundamentally boils down to, if you have data that fits in memory that you don't care about losing, it's not bad. Um, but my, my other problem with MongoDB is, you know, they, they, they've set it up to try to minimize configuration so developers can get started really quickly, which, which, is, which is great for screencasts and stuff, um, but it means that MongoDB, when you, first, when you install it in a default configuration, is writable to the entire internet. Seriously, the, the first customer I encountered using MongoDB, I looked at it and went, oh, no, it, they seriously didn't. They say, hang on a minute. Um, and I, I, I basically went, you know, you know, I've been saying that we need to look at your server configurations and lock them down a bit. And the customer CEO goes, yeah. I went, look at this transcript. And the customer CEO goes, what's that? 
That's me connecting from the machine that my IRC client runs on to your production database with full write access with no password. <laughs> and the CEO goes, yes, so when can you bring us this admin on project for us? <laughs> Right answer. Great guy. But anyway, uh, <laughs> seriously, that Mon MongoDB, it, it's so wide open. It is Goatsy by default. I, I, I do not want Goatsy as part of my production infrastructure. Thank you very much. Anyway, <laughs> um, the other thing is, I want to be able to grab stuff. I don't, I, you know, um, one of the things that, that you end up doing in this sort of work is, Lots of data aggregation, yeah? You know, you know what happens if you, if you do a group by query on MongoDB and get more than a thousand results back? Ah, the reason you don't know that is you can't. If the, at the point at which the query reaches its 1001 result, MongoDB throws an error and says to you, oh, that's too much data now. The way you need to do, what you need to do now is rewrite your query as a JavaScript map reduce. Well, thanks. Uh, so I mean, certainly for this purpose, it's not happening. Uh, uh, so, well, okay. Uh, and I, I want to be able to diff stuff as well, is the other thing. You know, if, if you're recording what packages are on a machine, it's really nice for a sysadmin to be able to actually diff between what's changed on the machines. Um, and we've already got really nice command line diff tools. So you, you don't want to have to reinvent all of that. Re reinventing all of that will be a lot of wasted billable hours. If I want to waste my customers' money, I'll suggest they install MySQL. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, right, obvious solution then is Git. Uh, right, so let's put JSON in Git. Uh, trailing commas. Oh. JSON and trailing commas. Oh, no, 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 no. You see, the, 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 the great thing is, the parser, you can use a relaxed parser and it will load a version with trailing commas. Can you find any JSON emitter on CPAN that will print it out with the trailing commas? No. So, um, I solved this in the usual approach. Um, I grabbed Phelon and shouted, well volunteered at him. Uh, <laughs> And he wrote a module called JSON Diffable, which I have a feeling we still didn't release because we keep forgetting to document it and hit the upload button. Um, but that, that, will get, that will make its way to CPAN reasonably shortly, and it is in Shadowcat Git. So um, if, anybody want, if anybody wants this for the same sort of purposes, please feel free to send us some documentation, and you can ship the thing. I don't mind. Uh, right, so um, so you do, you've got um, snapshot trees. Oh, it goes out, gets the information, writes out a tree of JSON, commits it into Git, great, we've now got all of the history there. Uh, nice and easy, but, so, uh, you know, you, you send it out to, uh, just a second. The, the, this is the moment where I go, hang on, I don't remember this slide from the run through before, what am I being stupid about, there we go. Right, so, the basic process of this is, you go onto the machine, pull all the data, check the packages, go and look for Git repositories, go and find the Perl modules, get all of this information, um, dump it into a Git repository, hit a commit on it, and then you go, okay, we, we, we can diff, we can um, grab it, that's all great, but you also want to be able to look at it graphically. Um, so the answer to this was to knock up a quick browser in WebSimple, uh, which I actually, I, I, wrote, I wrote the first version of this, um, basically at the same time as writing the slides for this talk while I was at Yap CNA. Um, so the, the, the code may scare you a little bit because I was writing very quickly rather than very comprehensibly. Um, but I am going to show you all of that because I did manage to successfully get the wireless to let me pull all of the code locally. Um, first though, sudo. Oh, sudo is so much fun to deal with. Uh, just a second, how long am I running? Yep, that's good. Anyway, um, so you need to be able to sudo because obviously you're not going to allow an automated piece of code to log in as root. Okay, you might allow that, but I, I'd, I'd really rather not use it even if they let me. Um, you know, if, 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 I, if I wanted that sort of platform, I'd get them to install MongoDB. Uh, <laughs> sudo, sudo, oh, 
Sudo drives me insane when I'm trying to deal with it non-interactively. Because uh, you have to deal with password prompts. Okay, password prompts are fine, except it attaches to the TTY. So the only way to handle that is to have IO colon colon PTY, and that's excess. I can't ship excess onto 50 heterogeneous machines. I can ship all the POPL stuff, can't get the TTY. So sudo minus capital S says, OK, please don't use the TTY. Accept the password on studin. That works great. Um, so, but now you have to read studer. And th this, this is where it starts getting entertaining. Because the thing is, um, OK, you've now got a prompt on a remote machine. Now, object remote can then loop back and basically have a remote object on the master machine where it prompts for the password. That part's OK. Um, but now, now you have to check for the correct output. And trouble, right? You, you know, it, it's typical for Unix to, If everything goes fine, they don't say anything, and you just get a prompt back. Turns out that's not always a feature. Because if there's no prompt, you don't get any output. Whatever, you, whatever else you were calling just starts running. So how do you tell that it actually started running? Um, so <laughs> what I end up doing is having sudo run that, <laughs> which then goes on and execs whatever else I wanted to run. Um, and then I can detect the go line. That solves that problem. Um, it, 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 all, it, it works pretty much well enough um, in the sense of, in 99% of cases, it works. And so far, the only server we've had it not working on, um, I, I, I went to the customer and went, hey, uh, this machine seems to be configured really strangely, so th this isn't working. And he went, wait, that machine's still running? I thought I turned it off six months ago. <laughs> Coming back to why we actually need this code, right? <laughs> um, but what it does is if it gets something it doesn't expect, it goes, unexpected line from sudo exiting now. Because, you know, the last thing you want is a piece of code that's running as root carrying on when it doesn't know exactly what's happening. An exception is a lot better than it going and doing something random as root, yeah? Um, so I, I, I got unexpected line from sudo. What, what's going on? So I, lo I, I, go, I log in and check. <laughs> Thanks, sudo. Because it, it turns out, even, even in minus S mode, where it knows you're dealing with it from a script, it still prints that message. <sighs> and I, OK, I, part, part of me was quite tempted to say to the customer, hey, do you mind if I go and patch sudo? Um, and then it occurred to me that actually getting the patch sudo onto the machines would require the code to already be working with the unpatched sudo. So it, it kind of became pointless, and I didn't bother. But <sighs> anyway, um, time to show off some code. So uh, here we go. Right, that's the tree browser. Give me a moment. Sorry, I, sh I shall now proceed to slow down slightly because I need to be in the right directory to show you the right piece of code. Moment. So, um, ah, that's the old one using YAML. I'd forgotten that was there. Obviously, I shouldn't just show you random files. I should show you the files I meant to show you. Here we go. Right. So, um, the, the, the top level package is just a version container. Um, the actual point is the gatherer. So, what that does is you basically give it a list of hosts and a list of probes that you want to run. Um, the uh, bridged thing is basically, in some cases, you've got a machine that you can only get to by SSHing through another machine. Uh, fortunately, once you've chained object remote to the first machine, object remote already, already has a copy of object remote there, so you just chain it onto the next machine, so you can bridge across fine. Um, and so that, that goes and pulls all the data and writes it. And then you have, you have all, all sorts of um, little modules that do probing. It's actually quite, it's, 
I'm so, I, I, I feel a bit odd showing, showing this stuff off, because you look at it and you go, you know, th this really isn't that exciting. But kind of the whole point of this, because it's systems code, is it isn't exciting, it's just useful. You know, um, ex exciting in systems code is a great way to be woken up at three in the morning because everything crashed. Um, so, grabs the past WD file, goes and looks for information. So, we, have a, we, we try, assuming we've got root access, um, it can pull back the cron tab, check what keys are installed, um, figure out what groups are in there. And it, I mean, this is, none of, none of this is that interesting. The, um, the repository stuff is fun. Just a second. Let's, let's go and look across the entire system, find every single Git repository, and then go and pull out the Git config. That's, um, yeah, that, that, that took a little while to convince it to do exactly what we wanted. Um, but it produces a fairly decent collection of output in the end. Um, so uh, then it's like, okay, we, 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 have a, we have a file, we have a directory structure full of JSON. So at that point, you need to actually load it. This, this is where I do the sensible thing, which is break out web simple, because it, it's, it's too small to use a full framework for. So you need a directory route using I/O all because, frankly, I am so bored of writing. Of, you know, even with autodie, open my $FH, yada, yada. No, no, I'm just going to use an OO interface to it. Um, and then the idea here is um, you have a dispatcher. The uh, star star takes basically any URL. Um, the strange stuff with, with um, slashes and backslashes is so that you can actually have um, stuff that's got a slash in it and it still renders through sensibly. Um, and then the uh, response filter thing basically wraps around on the way. So. Um, having done that, you can, where, where's the bit of code I meant to show you, sorry. See, this is why I don't normally do live demos. It's not just that they go horribly wrong, it's that I'm really bad at them. Anyway, um, the table rendering, yes, that is actually valid Perl. That is, that, is, that is the sheer joy that is HTML colon colon tags, which is a tiny module sat inside um, WebSimple, which means that all of those um, inline tags actually get rendered through to HTML on the way out, uh, which tends to make things a lot simpler. It, it, it's one of those, th this thing is so much data and not presentation that there's not actually any point to having a templating system. Um, and the structure recursion is just basically, it walks down through the file structure. So uh, if I do a find on the data directory, Um, you can see we've got uh, two machines worth of um, JSON files there. And then point this at down. So if I actually hop into a machine, let's go into the dev one. Um, and then now sudo is, is going to be empty at which point you just have an error uh, because th this particular test run wasn't done as root. Uh, however, ah, please excuse me. I, I, am, I, am used to, I am used to about sort of 10 degrees centigrade being comfortable. I am actually sweating enough that I'm having trouble using the mouse on the laptop. Uh, <laughs> if you go into the user setup, um, you do, you've now got, this is, there is absolutely no special configuration in this. Um, if I go into the file, uh, this was users.json. Yeah, it's not one. There we go. And it, it, it is just a JSON structure, and the tree viewer unrolls it into a table for me. I have absolutely zero configuration to get this result which is why it's kind of ugly, but it means I can, add a new, I can literally write a new probe, and as soon as that new file turns up in the repository on the next introspection run, I've already got an interface to browse it. 
um, and then we'd, we can work from that to actually figuring out um, better UIs for stuff. But the really nice part is it can actually do side-by-side -side viewing. So if I hit that, um, I can now go in and say, look at packages and look at what's installed. And that gives me a complete list of all packages on the systems, what versions, so you can look through and see where they're not quite the same. And when you've got a package that's only on one machine, it shows up in the, that machine's column, but not in the other. So for, for, for trying to figure out um, how to bring machines in line with each other, this stuff is so useful. Um, so um, all of this is, this is, Again, I, 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 I kind of I don't know what to say about this because, because it's not exciting, it's not hugely shiny. What it is, is really useful, <laughs> which, which is just so much nicer when it comes to server code. So um, what I'm going to say is, I believe there's still 10 minutes in the um, time slot. Um, given I've tried to give you a very quick walk around, um, System Introspector, is sat in git.shadowcat, so's JSON tree viewer, so's JSON diffable. Um, so double check. Right, of course my wireless has fallen over, so I can't point at it, which is why I had to ask sync everything down locally, why I only have a small amount of data to show you. But um, please go, go, go and have a look at it. If you're in a similar situation, have a play with it, hop onto Hash Web Simple and talk to us. Because obviously our, our development so far has been very much focused on what the customer needs. So generalizing this to be useful to other people, you know, other than object remote, which is already general on CPAN and oh my God, I suck at writing documentation. So there's not nearly enough of that yet. Um, yeah, there's a man on the third row laughing. Little does he know I'm probably going to get him to write half of it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, but I, would, I, I guess, really, um, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, or suggestions? Well, that. The main advantage was these machines didn't actually have um, any automated administrative account already there. So basically, the process of doing the initial setup was for me to hand an object remote script to the uh, customer's CTO, who then used the sudo capability, because it only prompts for the password once, and then it remembers it and sends it to the other machines. At which point, that then meant at the, once it had finished sudoing, there was now a root object remote session on all of the machines. And that, that root object remote session then set up the administrative user, installed an SSH key for it, and gave that passwordless sudo. At which point, we're just SSHing in and sudoing without any of the faffing. Because if I install an, SS, an, S, an SSH root key on all of those machines, at some point, one of the customer developers is going to think it's a good idea to use it. <laughs> uh, and to be entirely honest, I'm not sure I trust myself to have that capacity. It, it's, it's much nicer to have, a, to have an introspector account with passwordless sudo, because then you can control specifically that account. So if you need to shut off the introspector system, you just remove the key from that or disable the account. Whereas my experience is if you have something like um, an SSH root key, it starts getting depended on by multiple things. So then locking it down later becomes really difficult. Um, I, 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 st I still remember there was, there was an ISP that I worked at back in 2002 or something. 
Um, and three years later, when they finally disappeared by being bought out by a bigger ISP, as always eventually happens, um, there, were, there was one particular administrative password that a lot of the automated services used to talk to each other that hadn't been changed, that was one that I'd set a year before I quit. And it was still there, because as soon as that password got used for two things, nobody worried about using it for a third thing, so then nobody worried about using it for a fourth thing. And then at the point at which I left, they suddenly realized that they had absolutely no chance of changing this password in a way that didn't actually cause a production outage. So they, 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 they decided basically um, operating on the assumption that if I wanted to screw with them after having quit the company, I could find plenty of ways to do it that I'd consider funnier than messing up the production services. Um, absolutely correctly, I can think of many funnier things to do. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it, it, it was simpler to not change it. So one, one of the things I'm doing here is basically going, I've seen this go horribly wrong. Let's try and minimize the chance of, his, of it going wrong the same way again. Oh, um, definition of a junior consultant. Somebody that you pay to give you the benefit of their own stupid mistakes. Definition of a senior consultant. Somebody you pay to give you the benefit of theirs and all of their previous customers' stupid mistakes. <laughs> Any th anybody else? Yeah, when, I, when I get next to no questions, I, I, always want, I always wonder if it's because I was completely incoherent or if the audience is just stunned that I decided to write this code at all. <laughs> Go on. The introspection stuff is offline, as it basically, it's run on a cron job. Um, s s some of the probes run once an hour, things that are ga gathering things like running processes and memory usage and stuff, and then things like checking the packages run once a day. Um, basically, do, do, doing a brute force check across the entire disk and finding every single Git repository and every single um, installed Perl module. And bear in mind that this is a one local lib per deployed application style setup. You, you, you can't do it live. Um, it's just not going to happen. Um, I think we actually have... Where's the... No, no. I, do, I did actually have a full set of Git repository data, but it appears that, that that's in the extra data that I didn't manage to SCP before the wireless collapsed on me. So um, I can't actually show you that part, sorry. That was, that was the one I, I, I pulled up earlier. Um, one of the nice bits, actually, is the fact that it can give you a list of things that can currently be upgraded. As soon as I actually find it. There we go. That, that's a list of upgrades that we haven't got round to doing on that particular dev machine. Happily, it's, it's been a couple of months since I collected this data, so um, none of this is actually any risk to the uh, production system. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I'd, I, I will note for the record, the packages stuff is currently only apt. Um, the reason the package, the package stuff is only apt is the people who um, sponsored it only use Debian. Um, if, some, if somebody wants to contribute a package introspective for any other operating system, I will happily give you a commit bit. But at the moment, I've only been running it on Debian systems. Therefore, while there's room for support for other hosts, it's, it's currently primarily configured to um, handle Debian stuff. Right. The five-minute bell just went. It's going, to t it's going to take me about five minutes extra to get downstairs and have a cigarette and still be back for the lightning talks. So at this point, no stupid software. At this point, I'm going to say thank you very much for listening. <laughs>